today. My name is Pastor Joe. Let me say welcome here to the First Church of God and also welcome to those of you that are joining us today on our Facebook Live. We count it a privilege for you to join us here as we worship the Lord. We are going to start off, first of all, by just making you aware of some important announcements here in the life of the church. Yesterday was a great day for us as we sought to reach out to our community by showing them love. And uh, there were many people that came and helped us from this congregation. And so from the church, there were 47 people that came yesterday. And those of you that actually worked yesterday, first of all, I want to publicly thank Deb Miller, who is back in the tech booth today, for doing such a great job. this morning. She could not have done it without her team. So those of you that were serving on her organizational team, would you mind standing, please, and let us show our appreciation to you. These are the people that work out here. And then those of you that all served yesterday, would you mind standing and letting us recognize you as well. Thank you so much for being a part of that. Also, I want to express a word of thanks from James and Liz Mosher. They came by this week and picked up their diapers that were given to them by the church. Lord willing, they're going to be here next Sunday with their new little girl and also uh, with their son, Mason. And so they just wanted to say thank you. They have a thank you card posted on the bulletin board, but also in our uh, announcements for today. This Tuesday at 11.30, the Joy Group will be meeting downstairs. Also, this Wednesday night is our important service as we gather together for prayer at 6.30. The youth will continue to meet out in the youth house for a study around God's Word this coming Wednesday night. So youth plan to be here this Wednesday at our regular time at 6.30. Also, this coming Friday, I would appreciate your prayers for me. I have the privilege of being able to share a devotional to the football team of the Jefferson City football, High School football team. And this uh, Friday is a, a really pivotal day for them. They get to play their rival for the first time in history here locally. What's the name of the school? Capital City? <laughs> So Capital City and Jefferson City High School will be playing against each other. So I'm going to be able to give them a devotion that morning. The ladies of our church are also going to be able to feed them breakfast this Friday morning at the school. So pray for us as we seek to minister to, I think it's what, 90-some football players. And it's going to be a great time uh, for us to connect. So pray for us in that way. Also, if you wouldn't mind keeping this important date in mind. Saturday, October the 3rd, is going to be a prayer fest at the state capitol for God's people to come together and pray. I think you probably know that our nation is at a crossroads in a host of ways, and we as the people of God need to come together and to pray. As I shared earlier this morning with our Sunday school class, uh, the stats are in from Barner, who does a really thorough research of God's people. And America is losing 20% of the churches this calendar year will close. That's a lot of churches. And not very many are opening, particularly during this time of the pandemic. So it's crucial for us to be able to pray together. This coming Saturday is a massive prayer meeting in Washington, D.C., led by Franklin Graham. They're going to arrive there and have a, a prayer walk and a prayer time together, asking God's grace upon our nation. So we want to join them. You can join them, actually, um, by on the Internet. It's going to be live stream. You can go to Samaritan's Purse and find out how to really navigate that. We'll probably try to get some information to you so that you can do that more smoothly. But be a part of that. They've encouraged us to do it locally. So it's already been done for us locally by this uh, prayer fest on October the 3rd. They just asked the local churches to really support it. So we believe in prayer. Uh, so let's join that as we pray for our nation. It's good to be able to have these uh, young ladies here share today. We're going to play one more song. Actually, it's a medley of songs. Two great familiar hymns. It is well with my soul and how great thou art. And then when we get finished, we're going to have a great time of worshiping the Lord together.
Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord and praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idle, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory to his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Trim before, tremble before him all the earth. Will you stand together as we sing some great hymns of the church? The first one is, To God Be the Glory. <laughs>
today and we acknowledge that you are God. We say hallelujah to you because you are the great and awesome God. And we worship you today. May we worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you that we're able to be here. We're thankful for this gathering. And we want to lift up to you the various things that you have invited us to share with you. The burdens, the concerns that we have. Whether those be of personal nature, right now, God, in our spirits, we're just lifting up to you the things that are dear to us, that have pressed into us this week, that have been hard on us, that have sought to rob us, but we lift those right now to the throne of grace. We lift up our church family to you. Thank you for each one, from young to old, that we can be together, that we can encourage one another, even if it's through our Facebook Live page. We thank you for these that are joining us. And whatever the various needs that we have collectively, we lift those up before you and pray for the mercy of God, knowing that your grace is sufficient for us. We lift up our nation to you today. In many ways, you're calling your people to pray. And we want to lift up our nation today, our leaders, both locally, statewide, and nationally, for the challenges that are creeping in and trying to uh, cause unrest. We pray, we pray especially for the election that is upon us. We pray for your people to rise to the occasion to vote. We pray, God, that you'd be in all of the aspects across, whether in the local, in the state, and the national. We pray, God, that leadership would be given to us according to the will of God. Bless this time now as we're centered here to worship you. Help our hearts to be centered. Speak to us that which we need to hear today. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. God bless you. You may be seated. A couple of things that I think we ought to do here, and that is it is two precious couples' wedding anniversary today. So it's Michael and Ken Laramore. Hi, Michael. I think you're watching us. We're going to sing to you and your wife. And then the other one that celebrated their wedding anniversary today is Stuart and Amanda Yoder. So we're going to sing happy anniversary to these two couples. Can we do it together? Here we go. Happy anniversary. hymns today. Well, since we moved these three pianos up here, I said to him, I said, why don't we just sing some songs and have the pianos play, because to do all this work, we might as well utilize it. Amen. Amen. So we're going to sing some songs that you know. Sing as unto the Lord as Brother Stewart continues to lead us.
pray. Thank you, Father, for the Spirit of God. We pray for a richness in the Holy Spirit today. That we would understand the truth and that we would live the truth. So to this end, we pray. We recognize you and we honor you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Children are dismissed to go downstairs this morning for our time of children's church. morning we're continuing into the series where it's really amazing, but uh, this is actually Sermon 12 in the book of Ephesians, and we're now in the last actual chapter of the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6, and uh, as you know, uh, the last couple weeks we've been in uh, a sub-series uh, within this series. Uh, as we've looked at a taste of heaven here on earth, uh, we looked at the fact that in order for us as Christians to have uh, uh, a taste of foretaste, if you will, of heaven here on earth, that we must, it is not an option, that we must have the infilling and the power of the Holy Spirit to be at work in our hearts. Then we found out last week uh, how to have peace within the home, within the marriage relationship that was God's idea. We found out what the role is of the husband and also what the role is of the wife. Today, we're going to go into even further into the home and into our relationships and find out a little bit more what is said to children and also what is said to dads especially. Next Sunday, we hope to kind of wrap up this taste of heaven. Next week, we'll learn out what the scripture has to say to us as employers and employees. But today, we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 6, and I'm only going to read the first four verses. And again, if you wouldn't mind standing together in honor of the Word of God as I read this to you. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you, and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Of course, the very first thing that we see here in this passage is that the Apostle Paul is talking directly to children, and specifically to Christian children. To Christian children. This letter was written, as we know, to the church in Ephesus. It was read publicly to the entire congregation. That congregation would not have had children's church. The children would have been in the midst of the congregation. In fact, I don't know if you understand or not, children's church is rather new, and many of you probably don't even understand why we have children's church. How it came about. It came about because in the 1970s, there was a real evangelistic uh, thrust or trend called bus ministry. How many of you have ever been a part of bus ministry? Yes, my home church in Newcastle did bus ministry. We would go out on Saturdays, and we would canvas the neighborhood, and we would have, you know, sacks of candy, bubble gum. I did this as a 14-year-old going out with an adult. And we would knock on the door and ask kids if they would like to come to Sunday school and church. And, of course, they said yes. 
uh, for candy, and we would get them to come, and the next morning, uh, the bus captain and the bus would go out, and we'd pick up all these children. Well, there were no adults with these children, and these children came into the public worship service. They had no adult supervision, and many of them did not have any uh, experience being in a worship service, so there was some <laughs> rowdiness. What shall we do? Well, why don't we take them downstairs and we'll have something for them that we can manage. That's where children's church came from. Paul the Apostle, they didn't have children's church. So in this letter, he's not telling Nathan and Jennifer to tell their kids that they're supposed to mind. He does it for them. He admonishes the children right then and there that children are to obey their parents. And he actually gives four reasons in this verse at why children should obey their parents. The very first is this. They are to, because they are followers of Christ. Children are to obey, obey their parents because they are followers of Christ. This is extremely important to us. The reason that this whole submission right now that the apostle has brought to us it applies to every area of our life. So, so far, we have found out that the husband is to be submitted to Christ. Christ is the head of the husband. We have found out then that the wife is to be submissive to the husband because the husband is the head of the wife. And then we find out that the children are supposed to be submissive and to be obedient to both parents. This is the whole theme of this particular passage of Scripture. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord, the Apostle Paul says in chapter 5, verse 21. Being a Christian helps us meet the obligations that we have in life. So when there's children in the home, particularly if those children have had a relationship with Christ, they are to be agents, they are to be avenues within the home that peace is to be maintained. Will there be conflict? Will there be areas where there needs to be discipline? Will there be areas where, there's, where there is at times selfishness? Will there be areas where there's time of immaturity? Yes, but as a whole, children are to obey their parents because they are followers of Christ and that this is the will of God for them. They are to follow Christ by actually obeying their parents. In fact, this is a strong statement, particularly in our culture today. In order for children to obey God, they must obey their parents. I think I've told you this before. Uh, I love this story. In fact, she's one of my favorite women. In fact, I just told Casey Highfield about her a week and a half ago. Elizabeth Elliot. She's a great woman of God. She was married to Jim Elliott, who was a missionary in, in Ecuador, and in January of uh, 1956, her husband, along with four other men, were martyred by the Alka Indians. She and her little girl, a year later, go back to that tribe and win them to Christ. I mean, you talk about a, a great woman. Amen. And she tells a story. She came from a Christian home. And she tells a story about one of her brothers who were just absolutely fascinated with paper sacks. And he would get the paper sacks out. How many of you have heard me tell this story? He would get the paper sacks out and line them up all over the kitchen floor and just play with those and play with those and play with those. How many of you wish your kids would just would be satisfied with paper sacks? <laughs> Things were simpler in those days. <laughs> And it was time for lunch, and Mama told him, said, son, it's time for you to put the paper sacks away. It's time for you to come to the table and have lunch. Well, he drug his feet. He didn't do it. So she reminded him again. You know, because sometimes kids can get distracted. Do we know that? So she said, I need for you, I need for you to put the paper sacks away and come to the table. He said, well, I don't really want to. I want to see Jesus loves me. The Father was there. 
and said, son, it does no good to sing praises to God when you're disobedient to your mother. The wishes of the parents are the law of God within the home. They represent the authority of God. They do. This is why whenever there's rebelliousness within the home with children, it should be dealt with. Because my parents, listen, we are training our children to do what? To hear the voice of God and to obey the voice of God. Amen. So children are to obey their parents in the Lord because... They are Christians. In fact, in Colossians, where Paul gives the same, uh, the same command, he even adds something to that one when he writes it in Colossians. He says, For children obey their parents in the Lord, for this is well pleasing to the Lord. Well pleasing to the Lord. In order to have a harmony in the home, a husband must be submissive to Christ. Christ must be the Lord of the husband. Wives should be submissive to their husbands, and children must obey their parents in the Lord. The second reason is obedience is right. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. You see, my friend, there are certain things that God has set in order that make things right. So it is automatically right and fitting for parents when they bring children into the world, they're, they're wiser, they have more knowledge, they have more life experience, they're paying the bills. It's fitting and right then for children to obey their parents. A lot of the philosophy that would go around today is contrary to that concept of rightness that God has established. It would probably say, children, obey, I mean, parents, obey your children and make them happy. But see, for us, with it to have a Christian home, children are to obey their parents because of, their being, because of them being Christ's followers. And also because this is right. Remember the story of King Saul in the Old Testament. In fact, it was his down. It was his downfall. They were to go in and they were to conquer. They were to conquer this, this town. And uh, they were to slay everything in that town and dedicate it to God. You remember the story? And he gets this idea that he's not going to kill the king. In fact, he's going to bring the king back, and he's going to bring their best cattle, and they're going to bring their best sheep, and, 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 and they're, going to, they're going to offer that up to the Lord at sacrifices. And when Samuel the prophet comes, it is discovered that Saul has disobeyed the Lord. And this famous saying, this truth, comes from the mouth of Samuel the prophet. I know, Saul, that you're, you, you, you thought it was a great thing to, to come and, and to bring all those sheep and cattle that you were supposed to have killed in battle, including the king, and now you, you, you're, you're kind of justifying your disobedience by saying that you're going to offer these as sacrifices to the Lord. He says this, it is better to obey the Lord than to sacrifice. Sacrifice. It is much better. Obedience is far better in the eyes of the Lord than sacrifice. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right. I'll just, I'll just throw you in a little bit of thing, too. I learned this from Elizabeth Elliot, too. And it was one of the things that my wife and I sought to teach our three children. I have also told you this before. Children, the first two commandments that they should learn is know and come. Know. How many of you know that no is a part of life? It's a big part of life. So when our children came, we decided that we were going to put breakables away. No, 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 no. We're not going to safeguard our house. That we would safeguard our house as far as danger with electrical things. But we didn't put, you know, things that were breakable, things that, that we thought they shouldn't touch. They needed to learn that that is no. 
The other thing is, they need to obey the parent's voice when it says, when the parent says, come. Come. Obey. Children must obey parents. Have verbal authority over your children. It's so that God has verbal authority. In fact, I don't know if you realize that some of the unrest that we're having is because there are people that have not learned to respect authority. Amen. Can we say amen? amen. Next. I'm, I'm going to throw this one in too. Honor your father and mother. Listen, my friend. Honor is more than just obey. Honor is more than, it means that you show high respect. You, you love your parents. You seek to take care of your parents. You, you, you seek to honor your life is to honor them. And here's the thing that I must point out to you. The commandments of God, please listen to me. The commandments of God are to be fully obeyed. Let me tell you. Sometimes we choose not to obey our parents because they think, well, they didn't deserve it. Listen, the commandment doesn't depend on what the other person does. Whether you think your parents deserve respect, love, or honor, you are commanded to honor your parents. Amen. Whether they deserve it or not, God will deal with them. But we must do what right is right and, and honor our parents, period. And so we find out here that obedience is right. It is also here commanded. It says here, honor your father and mother. He actually refers to what? The fifth commandment in the Old Testament. This commandment does apply to the New Testament children. No. We are not underneath the law of Moses. Can the people of God say amen? Amen. amen? Christ set us free from the law and the curse of the law. But the law of the Old Testament reflects the righteousness and the holiness of God. We are by the power of the Holy Spirit. We are to live out the righteousness and the holiness of God. Of God. In fact, I didn't really realize this until I did some study. Did you realize that out of the Ten Commandments, nine of them are reinstituted in the New Testament? Do you know which one is not? Nine out of the ten are brought to the table, like this one here is, the fifth one. The only one that is not brought back up again in the New Testament is to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, the Sabbath day for the Christian is what? All days. You see, I don't have to work anymore to obey the law of Moses, <coughs> to do all these ritual things. I don't have to work and strive because of what Christ has come to do and has done on the cross. He has finished work. So because of that, I can enter, the book of Hebrews says, I can enter into a Sabbath rest, meaning I can rest from my labors. I can rest from my efforts of trying to get right with God. I just have to rest in Christ, and I'm automatically right with God. Now, the Lord's day is today. This is not the Sabbath day. The Sabbath means seven. It's the seventh day in the Old Testament, which is Saturday. But in the New Testament, the church, God's people, underneath the baptism and the infilling of the Holy Spirit, began to meet together on the first day of the week because it marked the first day of the week that Jesus rose again. And since then, we then began to do what? Meet and worship on Sunday. Now, I'm going to tell you something very personal. My family and I, we seek to honor this day. Our, our, our practices are going to probably be different than yours. 
We don't eat our own Sundays. We try not to buy anything on Sundays because it's going to make somebody else work missing church to serve me. That's my personal faults. We're not going to mow the yard. We're not going to do laundry. Now, if there's someone that's sick in the middle of the night, we'll do laundry. Do you understand what I'm talking about? But we seek to have a day of rest. Uh, it's important for you and I, and I, I heard this this week amongst the ministers, because uh, they really spoke to us as ministers Thursday at Poplar Bluff at the ministers meeting I went to. If I got up here and said today at lunchtime, I, I, I'm going to uh, go have lunch with my girlfriend, you would run me out of town, and rightly so. But if you found out that I kept working on my day off, and I didn't take a day off, you would almost admire me. Almost pat me on the back. It is important for you, each of us, to have a day of rest. Not to be right with God, as far as like our own righteousness, but because God has made us that way, that you have a day not to get caught up I don't know how God does it. If he kind of does it like he does it with the tithe. When you give him 10%, he makes the 90% go so much further. How many of you have found that to be true? Amen. You give God 10% of your income and even more, and somehow, I don't know how he does it, he makes the 90% go so much further than the 100%. He does that as well with your time. He does that as well with your time. If you will set aside times of prayer, times of rest, God will somehow make up the other six days. Six days you shall work, and on the seventh day you shall rest, because that's the way why God created the heavens and the earth. So it's important for us to have a day of rest, of honoring the Lord. And we find here in this passage of Scripture, honor your father and mother is the first commandment that has a promise attached to it. So God is saying that if you will obey this commandment, he, he, here's what you're going to reap if you obey your parents and honor them. First, it says here, it will go well with you. If you honor mom and dad, it will go well with you. Second, you will inherit the land. Now, this, of course, was when it was told in the, New, in the Old Testament, it was to the book, I mean, to the people of Israel. If they would obey their parents, that God would bless them as they would go into the promised land. But Paul the Apostle brings that into the life of the New Testament believer. And he's saying, children, if you obey your parents in the Lord, it's going to go well with you. Now, does this mean that every person that dies young has been disobedient to their parents? No. It's a principle. It's a principle and that's laid out as plain as day that if children would obey their parents, do as their parents are asking them to do, they're going to dwell more in what? Safety? Be spared some heartache? Be also spared some tragedy because of them obeying their parents who have more wisdom and more knowledge and understanding. Paul the Apostle brings this to the table. Honor your father and mother, for this is the first commandment with a promise that it will be well with you. Obedience enriches our lives, but disobedience robs us, and sometimes even life itself. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Next, that's the first group. The second group, it talks directly to us as dads. A Christian dad. This is the next point in verses, uh, chapter 6, verse 4. All of us know this, that children left to themselves what? Rebel. Left to themselves without any instruction, without any discipline, uh, can become almost self destructive. This is why it is crucial for dads to be on the scene. There are stories after stories in the Old Testament where dads uh, backed away, 
where they shunned their responsibilities, where they didn't do that which they needed to do. One of the first ones that comes to my mind is Eli the priest during the time of, of Samuel. His sons grew up and they were to be priests as he was, but they were doing vile things in the temple and as priests. For one thing, they were committing gross sexual sin. And Eli the priest didn't really deal with them. And because of that, Israel got in trouble. The sons, including Eli, lost their lives. David is another one. With Absalom, his son, who was very good looking. And David kind of backed away from the involvement that he should have had as a father in the life of, uh, of Absalom, and it caused such tragedy. So Paul the Apostle speaks to us as dads in this passage of Scripture, and he gives us our responsibilities. The first one is a negative. We're not to provoke our children or to make them angry. <coughs> Paul's day, the father had supreme authority. I didn't know this. But in the Roman Empire, that when a baby was born within the family, if the father went over and picked up the baby on the day of the baby's birth, the baby was accepted in the family. If the father chose not to do that, the baby was discarded and left to be exposed to die. That was in Paul's day. Paul is encouraging us as Christians that we are not to abuse, we are not to abuse the authority that, and the responsibility that God has placed upon us as men. That we're not to cause our children harm, we're not to cause our children uh, anger that would be coming in bitter, in bitterment and, and turning against us. We are not to lead them into being angry. Dads can do this several ways. One way that dads can do it is to say one thing and do another. Say one thing and do another. Whether it's to say, you know, uh, I don't want my kids to smoke, and the whole time they're smoking. That, that, that's doing one thing but saying another. Or, or to, pres or to uh, profess some sort of a relationship with God in the midst of God's people, but then at home it's a different story. That will lead children to be angry. Amen. It will. And I hate to say this. Well, I don't really hate to say it, but have you ever noticed? Now, there are exceptions. I'm an exception to this rule. But nine times out of ten, Kids will go the way the dad goes. They will. I thank God for godly mothers, godly grandmothers. But listen, if, if the dad is passive in the home about spiritual things, nine times out of kid, ten, his kids will be passive about spiritual things. Men, you set the tone. You do. This is why it is so important for us not to be casual about our faith because of our children and our grandchildren. They're watching. You better believe it. Yeah. They're watching. And so we find out here that we can cause, another thing is always blaming. How many of you have ever blamed your kids? Always being critical. Some of us have come up from, some of you in this room have come up in very critical homes. You couldn't please dad if your life depended on it. Criticalness, harshness. We can cause our children to become angry in that way, being inconsistent and being unfair. I, I'm really guarded, and my kids are here too. My oldest ones are in the room, so I gotta be careful. I have witnesses. 
My children know I do this, and I do this a lot. It's not necessarily a good thing. But they will ask and ask and ask and ask and ask me for something. And I'm real hesitant about giving an answer. How many of you have been with me? Because here's the reason. I don't want to commit myself if I know that I can't really fulfill that commitment. Now, it's different if I say, for example, we're going to go on a picnic. And it rains. We have to change our plans. No, I'm not talking about that. But men, as best as possible, we need to seek to fulfill that which we have spoken. Another way that children can become angry is by the way that the dad treats their mama. I saw this one time when I was in my 20s. It's one of the best sayings. The best gift a father can give to his children is to love their mother. That is so true. Watch, my friend. Men, your children are going to learn how to treat a woman by watching how you treat their mama. That's just the bottom line. Don't provoke your children to anger. And that's the negative. Now, the rest of the responsibilities that Paul gives to us are positive. The next one is this. Dads much must nurture them. Dads much must nurture them. To bring them up, that actually means to nurture them. To, to nurture them. Dad is to nurture the children in sharing love and encouragement. Here's, here's the thing that you also need to understand, man. You are the initiator of love. You are. This is why men are the ones that initiate with women. They are initiators like God is the initiator with us. So men should strive by the grace of God to be the initiator of love, of encouragement in the home, of support both to children and to mom. Now, are you going to get it perfect? No. But we must look at how we're going to nurture emotionally. How, how are you showing affection? How are you showing love? How are you showing uh, support? How are you there? Those are crucial responsibilities that have been given to dads. And I say this in love, but we've had several generations in this nation that have lacked all that. It is important for Christian dads to nurture their children. To nurture them, and this is more than just providing them with clothes and a roof over their head and food on the table. They should do that. In fact, the Apostle Paul says, if a man doesn't take care of his own household, he is worse than an unbeliever. But it's more than that. It's more for men than just providing food on the table. It's more than just providing a roof. It's more than just clothing. I mean, the state can do that. It's that you are to nurture them in the fear of the Lord. Amen. You're supposed to feed them, shepherd them, evangelize them, disciple them. That's our responsibility. Not the church. The church is alongside of us to support that which we are doing at all. Not to substitute for it. Men, we are to nurture, to love, and to pick the Bible up. To start devotions. To bring biblical correction. To pray with our children. Uh, to talk to them about where they are. To talk to them about what's going on in their mind. To know how to disciple them and to nurture them. That is an awesome responsibility. What an awesome privilege that we get to shape the lives of our children. Man, I'm praying. I don't know how God's going to do it. 
I may not even be around. I'm praying like three children of being world changers for Christ. World changers. Yeah. I don't know how, and I may not see it, but I serve a God that can do far above what I could ever think or imagine for my kids. Yeah. And that gives me hope in the midst of a crazy generation right now. Dads, we have the responsibility, the opportunity, the joy, the privilege of nurturing. Because this is why it's crucial, my friend. I'm just going to share with you my heart. If you came from a home that didn't have a dad and didn't have that, this is, I, that was me. But my heavenly father has taught me and has stepped into the place where my earthly father never was. This is why it's crucial that you go after God and let him go after you. Because he is the perfect father that will help you and that will aid you in doing that which you don't even know that you can do Amen. by his grace. Amen. Please, hear me. Slap me, slap me, slap me. This is to encourage us in the things of God. Amen. To see what we have before us and that God is willing to come right alongside of us and help us. Are you kidding me? I've told God a hundred thousand times, God, raising these three children, it's bigger than I can ever be. Pastor of this church is bigger than I am. Yeah. How many of you have ever been sometimes in parenting and you don't even know what you're doing? I heard some of those little mumblings around. Yeah. <laughs> this is why. This is why. In our lives. This is why we need the Lordship of Christ. This is why we need to have our minds saturated in the Word of God. That we can nurture our children. We can nurture our children. Next, dads are to discipline their children. The word nurture comes from the word learning through discipline. The word chastening is used in the book of Hebrews. Modern day teaching would say that we really need to let children do whatever they want to do and express themselves. And if we do anything that would hinder them, we're broken their personality. That is not true. That is not true. But we all know that discipline is, is a basic need and a basic principle in our life and discipline is a byproduct of love. For the Lord disciplines those he loves. <laughs> In fact, it says if you don't discipline your children, the Bible says you hate them. Because they're going to have a hard, hard, hard life. So dads, not only do we get to nurture them, we get to, dis to, to discipline them. Now, there are right ways of discipline. We should always discipline our children in love and not in anger. Amen? Amen. This is why sometimes you have to pull yourself away from the situation. How many of you know what I'm talking about? I'm not in the frame of mind right now to think this through. I sometimes have had to withdraw. I've sometimes had to go to another room, and I've sometimes even had to get down on my knees and say, God, right now, I could explode. But I'm going to submit, submit this to what, what do I need to do? How do I need to humble myself? Because I, I've said something wrong way, or I've said it in the wrong tone, and I don't have the right attitude right now. I need you to follow me in order that I can follow them. There are right ways of disciplining our children. There are wrong ways. Never do it in anger. It should also be consistent, filled with mercy and grace. These are to give assurance to the child, even though the child may not like it and may not agree with it. Listen, my friend, are you kidding me? 
your children, they have a sense of justice already instilled in them. You know they do. How many of you have heard, well, that's not fair. <laughs> Nine times out of ten, it's not. <laughs> so when they've done something, and they know that they should be disciplined for it. They know, they, they, they know, they're not dumb. They have a sense of justice. And when that is denied by their parents, it says something about who they are. It's not good. So dads, underneath the infilling of the Spirit and the love of God, we are instructed to shun that over a while. You know, when we first got married, I kind of resented this. Now I don't. It doesn't bother me. Because I love my wife and I want to support her. And I know that she is made differently than me. How many of you understand what I'm talking about? How many of you are different than your wife? In more ways than one. Exactly. And I used to kind of hate when it would be said, you know, we'll not wait till dad gets home. Because I felt like, but that's always making me the bad guy. I don't care to be the bad guy anymore. I'm not I'm like, dad, are you kidding? That's a thing. This is not about me. It's not about how I perceive. This is about what is good and fitting and right, first of all, the Lord, and second of all, my family. I'm called to do that. I'm called to think that way. We must discipline. Lastly, dads must instruct and encourage them. Dads must instruct their children and encourage them. Show them. <coughs> Growing up with a dad, without a dad, <laughs> I didn't know how to do anything. I'll never forget when I went to Houston, Texas, as a student at Gospel Bible College. <laughs> oh, it was pitiful. I got a job at Sutherland Lumber Company. They have a store in Fulton. They had three stores in Houston, and I got a job with about. Oh, probably 12 other college students that were freshmen. It was good because I didn't have a car, and it was too far for me to walk. So I would hitch a ride with, uh, you know, some guys from, from the college, and I would work in the lumber department. Well, they only had two departments. They had lumber department, which was outdoors, and then they had the, the um, hardware department that was indoors, and they put me in the indoor department, which was hardware. Well, listen, my friend. I didn't know a nail from a tuna fork. <laughs> <coughs> I was pitied. They would come and ask the customers, would come and want me to help them. <laughs> I was a great actor. I had to go ask another guy or my supervisor, you know, where's this? Why is this? You know, all that. I learned more working for Southern Lumber five years as I went to school. It was amazing. But dads were to take the time to instruct our children. Yes, definitely in the things of God, but also in life's applications, in, 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 in life's things. When, uh, when I'm away, I've already instructed my son, Jonas, it's going to be there on Gavin. Here's what you need to do in order to secure the family by locking up the house and turning on the lights. This is your job. <coughs> this is your job. This is your job to mow the yard. I mean, I can mow the yard. I can put gas in there. Can I, Jonas? <laughs> but how many of you understand what I'm talking about? There needs to be this instruction. Now, and where I need the grace of God, and maybe you do too, uh, is I need patience. Because sometimes I can lack patience and I just want to do it myself, and which I can get it over with quicker than it would by trial and error. Do you, does that make sense to you? But we're supposed to instruct our children. And then when they do it, if there needs to be some correction, because there will be along the way. I mean, the Lord's correcting me all along the way. But if our children need to be corrected, that we do it in such a way that it encourages them, that 
shows them. It's a tall order for both. It's a tall order for children to obey their parents in the Lord, for this is right. It is also a tall order for us as men, humans, human beings, that have all kinds of bumps and bruises and make all kinds of mistakes. This is why we need the Spirit to help us to be the kinds of dads that God has called us to be. That we're not to make our children provoked, that we're to nourish them, that we're to discipline them, and that we're to encourage them by instruction. We you pray? today, Father, um, as we visited some real close, close relationships over the last several weeks, from our relationship to our wives, to wives' relationship to their husbands, to children's relationships to their parents, to the relationship that dads have with their children. It's a little tough for us at times. It's, it's really at the core of where we are. In fact, if we're honest, in many times as we look back, these relationships of what have brought is what has brought us the greatest pain in life. So I pray. We pray through your amazing grace to us, through the Spirit's infilling and power, that we won't just go haphazardly through these relationships and kind of like hope that it all works out, but that we intentionally seek to obey you and to submit one to another. We pray this in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask today, if you're a dad, would you just mind standing? It doesn't matter if your children are still young in your home or if your children are up and weird and you've even got grandchildren and your children are, you've got your children weird. If all of you that are men that are fathers today, would you stand up? Let me pray for you. I mean, it's Father, we're here as men today. We all come from different circumstances, different upbringings. We're all totally made different. And yet this same assignment has been given to us, this divine assignment of how to father our children in the Lord. First of all, may we be submissive to the Lordship of Jesus Christ over our personal lives, our public lives, us as men. Second, help us as men to love our children, to be connected to their world. Help us to model what you are like to us from your patience, from your understanding, from your consistency, from your embrace, from your love. Help us to instruct them in the things of God. To be honest, that's intimidating to us. And many times we cower back. And we've let it be done by the women. We've let it be done by the church. We've let it be done by the super, uh, by the uh, Sunday school teachers. But God, we want to be in that place that you've called us to disciple our children, whether they're still at home or whether they're already out of the home and have children of their own. It changes for each of us in the various seasons but help us, we will not provoke them, but that we will instruct them in the ways of God. That we will discipline them, if that's still our task, depending on their age. So we look to you. It is bigger than us. The job, the task, the responsibility. But we're looking to you to help us. And we're praying that our children 
Well, above all, know Jesus Christ and love him supremely. That is our prayer as dads today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for being with us today for our time of worship. Uh, and to be honest, that was really half of the sermon that I had prepared this morning. But God had kind of spoke to me and thought, you know, these two issues are really going to be enough for us to look at today. And I trust that God has spoken to you as he's spoken to me in the study for this message today. I want to thank those of you that are on our Facebook page. Thank you so much for joining us. Join us again next week at the same time. We're going to say goodbye to you, and thank you again for joining us. May God bless you and your Lord's Day together.